maybe it's time to start again. My, uh, uh, my brief in this lecture is to talk about uh, potential automorphy theorems in the reducible case, uh, sorry, in the ordinary case. Uh, so these are theorems of the following general form, and I'm going, we're going to talk about them for mod L representations, but given the automorphy lifting theorems that uh, David has been talking about, you get uh, analogous theorems for erratic representations, so they're going to be I have some mod L representation, well then the simplest uh, potential automorphy theorem would be that there exists some finite extension uh, such that R bar restricted to G F primed is automorphic. Well, with these mod L representations, that says uh, next to nothing because I could always make this trivial, but you, would, you can also impose some other local conditions. So for instance, uh, F might be totally real or CM, and F prime should also then be totally real at CM, where it, then this really has some content because the image of this is unlikely to be cut out of CM extension. And in fact, you can also arrange this avoids any finite extension like the extension cut out here. So that's the, the simplest sort of thing, but you might want more. You might want to say, uh, something about how it's automorphic. You might want to say something about somehow what in the terms of classical forms would be the level, or you might want to say something about the weight, the infinity, uh, the infinite component. So this would come from some automorphic representation pi. You might want to say something about pi infinity, and you might want to say something about pi v for the finite <coughs> primes p. That would be a, 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 a stronger <coughs> statement. Uh, so I'm going to talk about both uh, this morning. The, I am going to uh, consistently restrict to the ordinary case analogs in the non-ordinary case we will, we will come to uh, next week, but uh, the, the automorphy lifting theorems that David has described so far are only sufficient to prove such statements uh, in the ordinary case. Uh, we will use the statements I describe next week to improve the automorphy lifting theorems, or David will describe this next week, and once one has the improved automorphy lifting theorems, one can go back and redo this and get stronger potential automorphy theorems. <coughs> okay, well, I'm going to talk about two specific theorems that I've written on the board. The first is the somehow the, the, the weakest uh, sort of reasonable statement along these lines. It will say nothing about weight or level and so on. It will just be a, a pure existence theorem of an automorphic form with the right reduction. Our representation has the right reduction. And that will be proved from one sort of, with using one sort of techniques. And then uh, I will then deduce from this sort of simplest case a souped up version that I've put over here, which is a much longer statement and has, gives much better control of the automorphic representation. And the, and the techniques of proof are sort of entirely different. Uh, so let's start with the, with the simple statement. In this case, I have to be over a totally real field. And I have to take a symplectic Galois representation with multiplier character, a power of the cyclotomic character, particular power depending on the dimension of the representation. So this is only, even, for instance, it has to be an even dimensional representation. And then the conclusion very simply is that over some finite Galois totally real extension, there is an automorphic representation of 
GLN of the Adels of that extension, of the sort that where we know how to start doing arithmetic, so there should be some, should be self-dual up to a twist, should be regular algebraic, that's a condition on pi infinity, cuspidal automorphic representation, such that if I look at the Eladic representation associated to pi and reduce it mod L, I just recover R bar, or R bar restricted to GF prime. And I can also control a little bit about the type of this. Pi infinity should be the lowest Ah, well, that's the wrong thing to say. It should have the same infinitesimal character as the trivial representation. It's the sort of lowest regular weight. And secondly, we can ensure that at all primes above L, this was a mod L representation, the local component here is the Steinberg representation. And these two things together, I, the reason I put them in is that they will imply that pi is ordinary at L. Uh, which is, uh, if you like, just saying that, that you can give a definition of this in terms of the valuation of Hecker operators at L acting on the Iwahori invariance in pi L, or it's the same as R L pi restricted to the decomposition group at V for V dividing L being ordinary in the sense that David described in the last lecture, the image of uh, the image is upper triangular up to conjugation, and the Hodge Tate and the Hodge Tate numbers of the characters appearing on the diagonal are increasing as you go from top left to bottom right. One can improve this theorem in in a. <clears throat> I, I didn't put them in a, with the original statement just to avoid cluttering the statement any more than necessary, but there are a number of improvements one that are quite useful, although are technical, but can be useful in practice. I can, as I mentioned before, I can choose this finite extension actually to be linearly disjoint from any given finite extension. Uh, moreover, I can arrange that this extension is not only Galois over F, but is Galois over any subfield of F over which F itself was Galois. And this is actually very, in fact, these statements, you really need to prove them with this assumption too, because if you want to make inductive arguments, you, you sort of, or, or arguments in stages, you start with F, you get something happening over F1, which you arrange to be Galois over here, and then something else that happens over here, which you can arrange to be Galois over here. But then you've lost the Galois property over here, and when you put it back, things can start going wrong. So, in fact, when you argue carefully, it's very important to have this, as, this assumption in <coughs> so that it, you can arrange that, in fact, all the time, you're, every stage, you're Galois over some smaller field down here. And you also don't, can treat not only one of these things, but uh, I can give you a finite number, any finite number of R bars, R i bars, and they can have different primes Li, and they can have different dimensions Ni, and I can show that they're potentially automorphic simultaneously. Uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, it's the same field F primed for each of them. OK, so that's the first theorem. The second sort of souped up version of this, uh, I mean, I, there's also a version of this for totally real fields, but for simplicity, let me uh, stick to the case of CM fields now, an imaginary CM field. So <clears throat> I'm going to give myself uh, an imaginary CM field, an integer, and a prime which shouldn't be too small. So sufficiently large, rule out a finite number of primes L, so it should be bigger than 2n plus 1, and large enough that, the, that F doesn't contain an L root of unity. I'm going to give myself uh, a mod L Galois representation, which is irreducible, in fact irreducible even when I throw in an L root of unity here, and also a uh, character 
which I'm actually going to take to be a characteristic zero character. <coughs> so a continuous, a totally odd or complex con of, of a con an eladic character of the Gower group of the uh, maximal totally real subfield F plus of F. A totally odd character, all complex conjugations going to minus one, uh, Durham or Hodge Tate, and necessarily, as this is a totally real field, the Hodge Tate numbers will all be the same for the different embeddings of F bar into QL bar, and I'm going to denote them W. And I want these to be chosen, so if I take this representation, uh, R bar and the reduction of mu are polarized in the sense uh, we talked about, uh, I guess, two weeks ago, which means that there's a symmetric pairing on FL bar to the n. With, if, well, I have to choose a complex conjugation first. If I choose a complex conjugation, there's a <coughs> symplectic pairing such that the adjoint of R bar is R bar conjugated by this choice of complex conjugation uh, up to a multiplier, which is the character mu bar. Okay. So this is the same, same sort of thing I had before, except I'm now over an imaginary CM field, and I've, <coughs> I've got a sort of conjugate self-dual R bar with multiplier character mu with a little bit more. And again, I want to assert that this is automorphic, but I'm now going to say it's automorphic in a very particular way. I want to fix the weight. So the weight in Galois terms should, the weight of the automorphic form in Galois terms should be the Hodge Tate numbers. So for each embedding of F into QL bar, I'm going to give myself a set of Hodge Tate numbers, <coughs> H tor. And I'm going to require what the, the automorphic lift I find to have these Hodge Tate numbers. But because there's always a self-duality going on or a conjugate self-duality, I'd better arrange, I, ca I can't, the Hodge Tate numbers at Tor and at Tor composed with complex conjugation have got to be linked. So when I say what the Hodge Tate numbers are at Tor, the Hodge Tate numbers at Tor composed with complex conjugation should be W minus the ones we had at Tor. I'm going to give myself a finite set of bad primes, S, which will, should include anything that's obviously bad already, anywhere that R bar ramifies or anything that divides <laughs> L, but it, contain any, it can contain any, uh, it can contain more primes. You can put as many primes in it as you like, as long as it stays finite. And for each of these bad primes, at least those not dividing L, I'm going to give myself a lift, rho V, of the restriction of R bar to the decomposition group at V. And I, again, I'd better arrange that what's going on at V and V complex conjugation are compatible. So whatever I do at, at, at V, I better put the, the conjugate dual multiplied by mu at rho complex conjugation at V. And then the assertion will be that there's, a, again, a finite CM Galois extension and a polarized regular algebraic cuspidal automorphic representation of, <coughs> um, of that finite extension, of, of GLN of that finite extension, with the following properties. It, the corresponding mod L representation is the R bar we chose. So R bar does become automorphic over this field F primed. The, uh, so pi is, if you remember what pi chi was, uh, chi is a Grossen character and pi is a representation of GLN of the Adels of F prime such that uh, pi conjugate dual is chi times pi, something like that. So this factor of self-duality should be essentially mu up to the usual sort of changes of uh, shifts coming when shifts by that, you, that usually come in when you make the compatibility between automorphic forms and Gawa representation. So the multiplier, we're fixing them up. We are, we're asking that we get a fixed multiplier character. This pi should be unramified <coughs> at, 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 except at the, the 
set of bad primes I was being allowed, and indeed I can arrange that it's unramified at uh, <coughs> V dividing L. Uh, I can arrange that it's ordinary at L. I can arrange that it has the desired Hodge-Tate numbers, and I can arrange that at the bad primes, other than L, uh, it's connected, the, the restriction of the Gower representation associated to pi to the decomposition group at a prime W should be connected to, in the sense that uh, David's talked about, connected to the given lifting of the representation that we gave ourselves at that prime V. So, <coughs> uh, if you remember, that means in the, in the universal lifting ring of, of the reduction of this thing, these two things should lie on the same component. That's what this twiddle means. So in particular, uh, the, if I take the corresponding Vedelin representation and uh, restrict it to the inertia group and maybe forget the n, that will be the same for these on these two sides. So this is like fixing, this is saying that it's automorphic with a automorphic lift of fixed weight, and this is somehow is close to saying that you have an automorphic lift of a particular level. Okay, are there any questions about the statements of the theorems before I move on? I give myself a pi and a character chi such that I don't remember which way around it is now, something like pi ju chi is pi c or something like that. Uh, the, the reason for keeping the chi is that there could conceivably be more than one, and it's somehow useful to keep track that you've got the same one on both sides, the Galois side and the I don't think so, no. No, because I can always, as I'm allowed myself a finite base change, I can always arrange that it looks ordinary. Uh, I haven't said anything about how L behaves in this extension. Do you have a little bit of freedom of the theorem B as a remark? Ah, yes, good point. I was going to say that. All these remarks apply equally over here. And I also wanted to remark another technical thing that can be useful in practice. The condition that L is bigger than twice the dimension plus one can be relaxed. Uh, so I only need uh, L greater than or equal to twice D plus one, where D, what is D, I restrict uh, R bar to the subgroup generated by all the Siloff L subgroups and take D to be the maximal dimension of an irreducible component after that. So where D is the maximal dimension of R bar uh, restricted to subgroup of GF generated by Siloff L subgroups. Of uh, irreduce, sorry, of an irreducible component. So the use of this last technical remark is that in the arguments uh, we'll be using next week and indeed that we uh, will be using today, you, you will often have to tensor with some, take a given representation and tensor it with some other representation, often induced from a character. And every time we do that, we would throw away more and more primes. But the things that induce from the character, of course, have 
uh, image not divisible by dimension of the, I mean, the order of the image isn't divisible by L at all, so that if you use this phrasing of it, the <coughs> then conditions get no worse when you do that. Uh, th this condition is, as you probably saw in David's lectures, is to ensure what uh, Jack calls adequacy of the image of R bar. So it's, it's this and this together. You can soup up to get more properties, group theoretic properties of this finite subgroup of GLN FL bar, which are used. No, again, because I'm, I'm, this extension uh, f primed over f can be very ramified at L, so I can make it look locally, say, trivial at L, and so you can get anything you like. I'm sorry, about John A, I, I, I don't see any use of this. There isn't. There isn't. I don't know any use of it if you don't have, <laughs> if it's not irreducible, but you don't need it in the... Yes, yeah, so I guess the, this representation as a characteristic zero representation will be irreducible. But it could nonetheless be that its reduction modulo L was reducible. Okay. Yeah. Well, this totally real. Yeah. Oh, you still have the complexity uh, 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 Avoids that. But also, in fact, once you put this strengthening in, then you could certainly ensure that the image doesn't change, because this f avoid could be the well, extension the cutout. Of, so just the complex conjugation to imply that the result is not trivial. Yes, I guess so. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, well, I've got two things to do. I've got to, I'm not sure which order to do them. Maybe I'll first of all try and explain how you deduce uh, theorem B from theorem A. And then I'll try and say something about the proof of theorem B. <clears throat> well, so f I can assume, first of all, that all primes, by just making a series of base changes, I can assume that uh, V in S implies V split over F plus. Um, I can also, as, as Shekhar asked, I can somehow, the conditions at L at this stage are looking different from the conditions at the other bad primes. But I can make them look the same. I can, by making a finite base change, I can always assume that locally I have a lift uh, with the desired Hodge Tate numbers. <coughs> uh, that's probably it. And, and which is crystalline. So for all V divides L, there exists some rho V lifting R bar restricted to G. <coughs> F V such that rho V is ordinary and crystalline with the desired Hodge Tate numbers, Hodge Tate tor rho v is the h tor and equally rho complex conjugate complex con at the complex conjugate place complex com take complex conjugate i get rho v dual times mu okay so this is just a local question and but, but i can assure that everything becomes trivial mod l so <coughs> okay 
I can also think of R bar as a representation uh, of the absolute Galois group of the totally real subfield into this group curly G n. Uh, FL bar. So if you remember, this group was GLN cross GL1 semi-direct product. A two element group which somehow left this bit, of, J leaves this bit alone and takes a transpose inverse multiplied by this on this side. <coughs> And there's a multiplier character from here to G N to G L one, which on this subgroup just picks out this entry and sends J to minus one. And I can assure that the multiplier character is mu bar. <coughs> I mean, I think I said two weeks ago that that's just equivalent somehow to this pair being polarized. And now I've got to somehow, if I'm going to apply this theorem, I've got to somehow produce a, a symplectic representation of a totally real field. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to induce R bar from, from F to F plus. Uh, but if I do that, well, uh, I mean, it might fail to be irreducible, for instance. Oh, I, well, I didn't need it. Well... I, I will, in fact, need irreducibility to make the argument work, although I don't need it to apply theorem A. So I'm going to want it to be irreducible, but I also want it to have a particular multiplier character and so on. So I'm going to have to adjust this first by twisting by a Grossen character if I'm going to satisfy these conditions. So there exists psi from GF to QL bar cross continuous <coughs> character such that Psi is unramified outside, uh, sorry, at S minus the set of primes V dividing L. So it won't change anything about what's going on at the primes S we care about. Psi is crystalline. Uh, psi times its complex conjugate is, ipsus, is this. power of the cyclotomic character times the inverse of the multiplier character we had over there. This will, er this will ensure that the induct when I induce this, I get a symplectic representation with the multiplier I want. Uh, I want psi over psi c, a wildly ramified like some auxiliary prime q, And this will ensure, this will be used to ensure that the induced representation is irreducible. And I also need that the Hodge Tate numbers of psi at, a, at an embedding of F into QL bar and its complex conjugate is, is very large. Uh, Another thing that could go on when I induce this is that I could suddenly lose regularity. But if I twist it with something that really stretches the Hodge Tate numbers apart, I won't lose regularity when they do the induction. And then R1 bar, which will be the induction from GF <coughs> to GF plus of R bar tensor psi, or psi bar will, in fact, map GF plus to GSP2N of FL bar with multiplier epsilon L to the 1 minus 2N. <coughs> and so I can now, I can apply theorem A to this. And I will get that there's some extension F1 plus over F plus 
uh, finite Gawa. Totally real. Such that uh, <clears throat> let me call this some yeah, I did call it R such that R one bar is automorphic over F one plus with uh <clears throat> Um, the fact that, well, it's, it's, in the original theorem, it's buried in the definition of this, which is, uh, if I rem <coughs> remember correctly, there's, so ch choose a complex conjugation, uh, then there is a symmetric pairing uh, on FL bar to the N such that uh, R bar sigma X, R bar C sigma C Y is mu bar sigma xy uh, for all sigma in gf. So if I'm right, this is enough to <coughs> ensure that when you do the induction, you can get a, sim a symplectic pairing. Well, and well, I mean, I'm not, not only a symplectic pairing, but I want a particular multiplier. Uh, And, well, given that this thing had a, had a mu here, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, maybe that doesn't. Am I using that somewhere? Uh, I think I'm u I, I've assumed there that mu is totally odd. Uh, and if I, I mean, of course, this condition doesn't, I can always, doesn't determine mu completely. I can twist it by the quadratic character defining f. But I guess if I took, if I took a non-totally odd thing here, I couldn't put mu here. I'd have to adjust it by that. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I try to say it means that when I, well, at the moment I've only done this characteristic L, so you don't really see it, but if, when I do something similar in characteristic zero, it's going to ensure irreducibility. Uh, sorry, it's going to ensure regularity. Because if this were characteristic zero things, when I did this induction, it, it's possible that the Hodge Tate numbers would start getting multiplicity two, even if R bar was regular. But when I twist by something which where the Hodge Tate things are a long way away compared with the Hodge Tate numbers of R, then this will be regular. So you'll see that in a minute. <coughs> uh, where was I? And which is and coming from a pi which is ordinary at L. Okay. <coughs> but we so we've got some sort of potential automorphy, but we haven't got the right, uh, we haven't satisfied all the conditions, sorry, that were over on this board that we wanted about the local behavior of the lift. So the first thing, the next thing to do is to create a lift which is, which does have the, whether or not it's automorphic, at least create a lift which does have the right properties. <coughs> So the first step will be to show that there exists R from G F plus to G N of the ring of integers of Q L bar, lifting R bar, multiplier, uh, <coughs> mu 
new um, crystalline ordinary and th whose restriction to uh, the decomposition groups are connected to on the same uh, irreducible component of the local deformation ring as the things we were given. <clears throat> Can I? Okay. And this is the uh, Carre van Tenberger. Maybe it goes back to de Jong or something. The <coughs> fairly standard trick. You write down a universal deformation ring uh, of R bar with all these properties. That thing makes sense. And you can. <coughs> estimate generators and relations and you over the vit vectors of FL or some here, vit vectors of some finite extension of FL, you, you estimate generators and relations, you find that <coughs> uh, generators and relations is greater than number of generators minus number of relations is greater than or equal to zero. So you deduce that the cruel dimension of R universal <coughs> is greater than or equal to 1. Richard, is this, when you say F plus, you mean F1 plus? I mean, are you assuming mm, R bar? Uh, no, F, F plus is OK. I mean. So is R bar ordinary? Oh, you may be right. OK, let's. Yeah, you're, pro you're probably right. I should have, I should have, I'm, I'm being careless. Say F1 bar. <clears throat> oh, yes, you're right. I've already just, thank you. So by this, by this condition, I've already made a base change so that it can look good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> OK. Um, and now, because when we study the relation between universal deformation rings and, and Hecker rings, we the work that's all been done is in the case of CM fields in this root group, uh, curly GN. <clears throat> I want to, having first of all gone from GN to GSP2N, I now want to go back to curly G2N. So um, uh, I'm going to get, so select F1 over F1 plus a quadratic, totally imaginary uh, quadratic extension. And uh, it would need to satisfy linearly disjoint from something, so it almost certainly won't be the compositum of F and F1 plus. <coughs> so the second one. And now this R1 bar, which goes to the symplectic group of order 2n, I can ad adjust it again so it goes back from GF1 <coughs> plus to G2n FL bar multiplier epsilon L bar <coughs> 1 minus 2m. And so I send sigma in GF1 goes on to just R, R1 bar of sigma L bar of sigma to the 1 minus 2n. And if I have sigma in GF1 minus GF1 plus minus GF1, uh, it will go on to R1 bar sigma J inverse minus epsilon L bar sigma to the 1 minus 2n, where J is the uh, <coughs> anti-symmetric matrix defining the symplectic group.
really defines uh, J defines GS. Okay, so going backwards and forwards, somehow going backwards and forwards between these groups and the symplectic groups is, is, relatively, <coughs> is, a, uh, yeah, is relatively straight. Uh, it's just linear algebra. They're, they're very closely related and you, you somehow never a problem to go backwards and forwards between one and the other. And then I'm going to define a universal de deformation ring for R1 bar, this thing of now twice the right dimension, <coughs> uh, well, I'm, not going to give, I'm not going to give a full definition, but with certain local properties. And the key thing will be that I get a map <coughs> from R1 universal to R universal given by, well, I mean, given a Give a de definition of R bar, I can perform exactly this same operation of twisting by phi and inducing, so I form induction <coughs> uh, from GF to GF plus of R tensor, my character which I think I was calling psi. I can restrict that to G F one plus this will give me a two dimensional symplectic representation of uh, G F one plus and then I can perform this same operation in turning it into a representation of this and R one bar tilde uh, sorry and the universal representation here will push forward to this thing. And now there are uh, two important observations. One is that this is, this is finite over this. And I think uh, David may have mentioned this sort of thing uh, in his talks. Each of these things only sort of loses a finite amount of information so that this ends up being finite over here. And secondly, this one, uh, we basically know by the... <coughs> Automorphy lifting theorems that David's talked about, we know how to relate this to a Hecker algebra. At least by mod out by the nilpotent elements, it will be, maybe make another base change or something, it will be isomorphic to a Hecker algebra. So in particular, this is finite over ZL. So the upshot is that this, so this uses an automorphy lifting theorem at this point. <coughs> so the upshot is that this thing was finite over ZL. So this ring has cruel dimension <coughs> uh, at least one, but it's finite over ZL. And so we deduce that this has a characteristic zero point. It has a QL bar, if you like. And the QL bar point will be exactly the, the lifting that we were asked to find. So we can <coughs> adjust the representation. Okay, well now, <clears throat> so now what I want to do is prove that R is potentially automorphic, because if R is potentially automorphic, it will come from a pi that will have all these properties, because we've constructed R to have all these properties. Yes. The irreducible. Uh, yeah, but this must be somewhere in here. Here. 
Oh. No, indeed, yeah, I wasn't writing everything down completely. When I made the initial base change, I had to ins ensure that it was linearly disjoint from the thing cut out by the image of our bar. <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry, where am I? But now we work over F primed, which will be uh, F1 plus compositum with F, a probably different quadratic extension of F1 primed. Over this field, we know that R1 bar is automorphic over F primed, coming from an ordinary automorphic form. And <coughs> hence, this other lifting will also be, by the theorem that David just explained, uh, this implies that uh, <coughs> uh, well, R1, which is, I guess, the induction from G F to G F plus of R tensor psi uh, restricted to G F sorry I'm I, I'm, I'm saying what, what am I trying to say So I want to say automorphic over <coughs> F F1, or even F1 plus, I guess, over F1, uh, implies that this one uh, is automorphic by the ordinary automorphy lifting theorem. <coughs> and Now we want to tear this apart. This is like restricting this to uh, G of F primed and then inducing to F, uh, so to G F of 1 and then inducing to F. So I want this, um, well, um, well so, so by just a simple base change argument, I can uh, actually also so induce from G F to G F plus R tensor psi. GF1 plus is automorphic. Because <coughs> it's automorphic after a quadratic base change, it was automorphic. And this <coughs> is the same thing as the induction from GF primed to GF1 plus of R tensor psi. It's restricted to GF primed. And now you want to theorem that tells you that if I induce something and it's automorphic, it was intramorphic before I induce it, at least over a cyclic extension. And that turns out to be true in this case. So this tells us that R tensor psi restricted to GF prime automorphic. And then I can st strip off the psi. <coughs> so let me actually took some time to figure out why that was true. I don't have time to go through the proof, but let me state the result that we need. So if M is an imaginary CM field, F totally real or CM field with M over F cyclic degree M. If R maps GM to GLN QL bar <coughs> is continuous irreducible. If the induction from GM to GF is automorphic of, of R, automorphic, and part of automorphic here means coming from something that's regular algebraic polarized self dual, so there is a regularity assumption. then R is automorphic. So 
this would this would be over f, uh, and this would be over m. But I mean, so what's the, the obvious argument is that you s you show that the automorphic form, <coughs> when I base change it back to m, is a sum of things. That's not hard to do. Uh, an automorphic direct sum of things are just as th as you would get on the Galois side. Um, and it's not, and those constituents are themselves <coughs> regular. If they are, if the constituents are polarized, then uh, they have elladic representations attached to them, and those elladic representations have to be the same as the, has to be one of them has to be the same as R. The the tricky point is to see why it is that the constituents have to be polarized, because you could imagine when I take conjugate duals, I can I <coughs> decompose, so, so this comes from some pi, and then I base change pi to m, and it's a sort of pi 1 automorphic direct sum, automorphic direct sum, some pi d or something. If each of these, or maybe I say base change m over f, is each of these is conjugate self <coughs> dual, it's easy to win, but the problem is what if the conjugate dual of this is another one? OK, so that's the <coughs> proof of theorem A by theorem B, which has used up almost all my time. Let me try and say in five minutes something about the proof of theorem A. So the proof of theorem A is, is the sort of argument that's probably now very familiar. You find f primed over f extension of the right form, an auxiliary prime L primed, uh, a motif V defined over f primed, with the following properties, V should be self-dual rank n. Uh, v has hodge tate numbers 0, 1, so on up to n minus 1. Uh, v will need to have multiplicative reduction, completely multiplicative reduction above L. <coughs> so the, if you like, uh, the Gawa representations that the, the Vedalin representation attached to V at a prime above L should have uh, the nilpotent operator N being regular. Uh, v is good ordinary reduction above L primed. <coughs> and then you want the mod lambda Gawa representation attached to V to be isomorphic to R bar, so some lambda dividing L, <coughs> and you want the a mod lambda primed Gawa representation isomorphic to the induction, so GM <coughs> to GF, say, of a character, M over F cyclic CM extension via character and then some lambda prime divides L primed. <coughs> and the need for this potentiality, this base change is contained in the proof that there is such, in finding such a motive. <coughs> and then the argument, because this is an induction, you know from the theory of automorphic induction that this thing is automorphic by <coughs> the automorphy lifting theorem David described earlier this morning you deduce that the whole lambda primed adic representation associated to V is automorphic. 
that implies every other Gawa representation associated to V, in particular V lambda, is automorphic. And this will imply that, well, that's what we... <coughs> Uh, that's what we're trying to. That's what we're trying to show. Uh, so, <clears throat> in this argument at this stage, because of the multiplicative reduction above L, the, this is uh, from some pi Steinberg above L, and also. Because of the Hodge Tate numbers being 0, 1 to n, this will have the same infinitesimal pi infinity, same this minimum regular infinitesimal character. Sorry? Yes, this is a lambda prime dadic representation, but restricted to the decomposition group above L, oh. it, it sort of looks multiplicative. N is uh, a regular nilpotent element. And so the corresponding pi by local global compatibility away from L will be, <coughs> uh, what was I saying? So that you get Steinberg. So these two things, as I say, imply ordinarity at L. So that this will assume that this comes from, a, not just from an automorphic form, but from one that's ordinary at L. So one can apply David's automorphic lifting theorems in the ordinary case. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that it seems to be completely impossible to ensure that this V has good reduction outside a pre-given pre set. So this is very likely to suddenly have bad reduction at some very large prime, which hasn't appeared bad up to that moment. So when you go, when you apply an automorphic lifting theorem to go from here to here, it's essential that that allows you to suddenly be able to gain bad <coughs> extra, extra ramified primes, which is why uh, without the theorems David described this morning, as opposed to the, the minimal theorems he'd described last time, we have, to, we have to be able to shift, move from one component to another on the local deformation rings at primes not dividing L primed, I guess, in this case. <coughs> so we, we need, crucially, this non-minimal automorphic lifting theorem to be able to make uh, this deduction here. Well, I was going to tell you a lot about how you found the uh, the motif. I don't have time to. I don't have time to do that. Or is there anything I can say usefully in a minute? Uh, I think the only. I th I think the uh, the only the only thing worth saying is that uh, this stage is that v is part of the cohomology of the Dork family x1 to the n plus plus uh, xn to the n is n times t for x1. So this is a projective hypersurface of dimension uh, n minus 2. t is a parameter. And it will be, the motif v will be part of the cohomology of this for a suitable choice of t. This capital N needn't be the same as little n. If R bar was mapping to uh, GSP 2N uh, or GSP N F, FL, we just had rational coefficients here. You could take <coughs> uh, uh, probably capital N to be little n plus 1. I think it's the right answer. <clears throat> but uh, somehow it's going to be crucial for the arguments that we can really have any residue field you like. And then you have to choose 
are likely to have to choose much larger capital N to get those coefficients. Uh, <coughs> anything. And the, the key thing about this, well, the key thing about the family of motives, we're, we're, to, to try and find one motive somehow, the only use, the only way I can think about it is to find a family of motives with a parameter. And if the monodromy of that family is large enough, which this will be, you can arrange that the, the monodromy of this family as T varies, will be the whole of the <coughs> symplectic group of whatever dimension it is. When you have big monodromy like that, you've got a chance of finding, proving that over some such extension, which you control in some ways, there is a point uh, <coughs> which realizes things like this. So one key aspect of this family is that it has large monodromy. And the second is that at the same time it's uh, Hodge Tate numbers didn't really matter that they were these, but at least they're regular. Uh, so we pick out a part of the cohomology of this which is regular, d distinct Hodge Tate numbers. And those two things together are, are what really allow the argument to work. Okay, well my <coughs> apologies for not having said more about the proof of theorem A, but no time. What kind of process to cohomology use it? You see, the slightly tricky thing is I've got to, so basically I want to project to a certain eigenspace for the action of this group H. But I want to have, but if I, if the coefficients of the motif, as it were, become a CM field, then I lose the symplectic pairing and I get some, so, so I have to be careful that I've somehow project here in such a way that I can really keep track of the underlying totally real field which is supposed to be acting. So, <coughs> uh, I first of all write down an idempotent in the group algebra of this which uh, is the following thing, some psi in H naught, psi one to the one psi two squared up to psi n minus n minus one over two, the n minus n minus one over two. Then I'm going to leave out a whole series of things, get them to act trivially, and then psi n plus n plus three over two to the n plus one minus n over two up to to n to the minus 1, and then I want the complex conjugate, so plus complex conjugate all times the elements psi. <coughs> so that's projecting onto two, uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm picking out two characters, this thing and its complex conjugate, and then, so this is in the group ring of say, Z one over n zeta n a primitive n through root of unity plus because it's the thing in its complex conjugate uh, H and then what I'm going to look at is the cohomology of I call this variety y t so let me do it in the Betty cohomology Z one over two n zeta n coefficients in the <coughs> in total <coughs> real subfield of the z zeta n. Then I apply the idempotent e, and then I apply this one plus. I guess this is a sigma in some funny font over two. Oh, and I need a tape twist, I guess. And this thing turns out to be rank n over here to have a alternating pairing um, to ha and have the right Hodge Tate numbers. You can check the Hodge Tate numbers by specializing t equal to zero where you calculated all these things. Um, 
this will be regular. The Hodge Tate numbers will exactly be 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1, with each with multiplicity 1. No, this exactly will, because, uh, I mean, if I had taken capital N equals N plus 1, I can t I, if I have FL, I can take capital N equals N plus 1, and I can just take the H invariance in the cohomology, and it will have all these nice properties. And I can just take Z coefficients. But you have to search harder if you, know, if you want to do bigger coefficients. <coughs> Is there anything been added to this so that it's easy to reference? No, it's been taken away because people have better automorphic lifting theorems, so the argument gets easier every time. I mean, uh, no, this was, I mean, this was all in our paper for, with, with uh, David and Tom. <coughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> Just maybe one other comment that I find interesting. That there's, a, there's a beautiful argument, I think goes back to the Velt, that calculates the monodromy of this family as T varies. Basically, the only input, be, I mean, it's just almost not, well, purely algebraic, almost nothing goes into it. It's quite extraordinary. But the, the only non-trivial input is that the action of a generator of monodromy at infinity acts unipotently. But as far as I know, there's no easy argument for that fact. The, I mean, in this generality, we, I, it was proved by Nick Katz, who first of all related this to hypergeometric sheaves or something, and then quoted old work of his. But it seems amazing to me that, the, that if, given that the action of monodromy at infinity does act unipotently, you can't prove it directly somehow. Well, I can't, but. <laughs> uh, you mean on the whole cohomology or on two Well, either. I think it must be true on the whole cohomology, but this bit would suffice. Okay, so next week, I guess David will start off.